Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to, uh, and the talk has kind of two uh, parts. The first part is about uh, work that I was able to do already a few years ago um, on languages that had been reported not to have normal uh, clausal embedding. Um, and um, the finding from that work is basically, well, they, after and then process scrutiny, they all have normal clausal embedding. Um, and the second part um, is trying to embed this result in a kind of view of um, more differentiated views and uh, of the evolution of compositionality than those that are currently on the market. Um, and sort of presents the, the, the mechanisms like clausal uh, embedding would be one of them, but negation is sort of a requiring a second step in the um, evolution of clausal embedding. Um, it's in some way an attempt at sort of reducing um, semantic modeling to um, in such a way that uh, this like clausal embedding is sort of more kind of, okay you can do this so um, so the so the first part is trying to in some way establish the universal here uh, namely that false belief is expressible by complement clauses in all languages and that by, that's meant to entail that all languages have something like complement clauses so false belief we take this term from psychologists um, take to simply describe a situation where the speaker thinks that something is false but describes this belief to another person. So Mika might, I, I mean it's actually raining, but uh, Mika might think it's sunny and I can describe that correctly as Mika thinks that it's sunny. Um, and, um, and in the sort of mid 2000s and uh, early 2000s, maybe it's not, uh, a number of people um, reported um, about languages that were supposed to not um, do uh, express false belief by plausible complementing, but have something else to express this. Usually something that's involving parataxis. Um, and um, so in, for Peter Ha, Everett, makes it clear that they don't have any uh, complex sentences and that they. Um, have something like have parataxis and then something like um, semantic embedding, so to sink, um, maybe as this is kinetically represented here, and then something like it is sunny. Um, and this would be used to um, um, represent a false belief claim. I mean, um, yeah, and the other, um, I mean, this is kind of, uh, it, the, the second um, class of languages that's actually older is in, in the, slightly older is in historical linguistics, um, especially um, Kai Deutscher has um, described uh, early Alpobolonian as a language that doesn't really have normal clausal embedding, um, but instead um, it also uses as a claim some form of parataxis with some um, um, qualitative markings and then the second clause. So the, the so schematic representation of this is um, so this is all from, from uh, uh, clay tablets from uh, thousands of years old. So this would be something like my lord tell me, um, and then this qualitative thing I represent here says my lord or according to my lord, and then it is sunny, um, and that would be the representation. Of three. And it, the this works that I did that we did also field work on a third class of languages that is supposed to only have um, is supported to have only direct speech. Um, and I'm not gonna talk about that today, but there the, our finding was basically that um, it's correct that they only have uh, something that looks like direct speech, but this what looks like direct speech in these languages doesn't have all the properties typically associated with direct speech in English. In particular, direct speech in English is kind of syntactically not transparent. It doesn't interact with the um, um, embedding sentence in a 
um, you can't extract and can't have theory. And those things we found um, in, so in one of these languages that we looked at, Matzis, um, uh, don't hold there for direct speech. So they, we, uh, um, so we, we propose an analysis of in terms of shifting all the indexicals but having a normal syntax. Um, there are other languages that fall into that class, but in the, in the pre -end, I, I don't know anybody has done work on those in more detail. But uh, at present, my expectation would be that they are kind of the same. Um, okay. Uh, So many slides. <laughs> okay, um, so I mean, there, there may be some initial reason that um, uh, he's skeptical of these non universality claims, other than sort of looking at the details actually of what they propose. But um, uh, I mean, one, one thing that struck me a little bit also is paratexas would require some kind of new mode of semantic uh, composition. So, in, in, um, I mean, um, uh, I mean, so see, I mean, you would need something like this to, to, to make this paratexas work, to have like a, a propositive speech act mode where, you could be a, where you're putting a sentence out there without actually asserting it. Um, and then you also need to have somewhere in this system a way of linking that up to this other uh, sentence that's out there. Um, and um, I mean, in, in complementation, that is done by syntactic structure, this uh, uh, linking up, and it's some tends to put the um, thing in the scope. And then, uh, I mean, I, so to the extent that these claims then are different, I mean, we would expect that these things are not rigid in syntactic order, but you should have them uh, in either, be allowed to do them in either order. Um, and so that's kind of. Some, uh, different. I mean, this. I mean, in some, some sense, this uh, work uh, by Davidson on um, that sense maybe is sort of could be seen as an as an attempt at spelling out this kind of paratactic uh, mechanism. Um, but I mean, in, uh, I mean, then if, if I mean, then possibly we should also change the analysis of this, but but there are lots of Problems with that type of analysis. Um, okay, the other things here are not so important. Try to make maybe for some of the lost time. Uh, okay, so go now to the PR. Yeah. And they have kind of captured the uh, public imagination because there's a rather sort of what you expect uh, uh, jungle dwellers to, to be like. They don't live in. Uh, uh, very fancy uh, dwellings, and they um, uh, don't speak Western languages very well, at least most of them. Um, and um, also, this finding that they don't have number words is kind of, uh, uh, I guess, lending some credence to this kind of that was actually found in some sense later. Um, and this, um, I mean, this type is hopefully a little bit over, but. Um, and then Everett um, sort of in, in did field work on this, um, like uh, first in the in the in 1984 while, and then, well, I mean, without further field work, he changed his analysis um, about 20 years later. And his initial analysis that they, that they have at least two types of embedding, one type that is kind of complementation. Um, this of, of finite clauses, and the other one is a kind of normalization um, construction. Um, and then in this later paper that uh, tells him to fame, he claimed so that they, they don't have any embedding, that this early analysis was wrong. Um, this work has been criticized already um, uh, quite uh, um, Obviously, poignantly or something, uh, by uh, Nevins et al. in the, like an exchange or what to pivot. Um, and um, I mean, I, I sort of um, uh, started like uh, looking at this in 
2009. So there was initially there was um, I mean, there, there, there was some new field work done by uh, um, Eugenie Stafford and a PhD student at the um, University of Manchester, and they, in, in a paper that is somehow circulating or never we um, pushed it through to publication, I have to confess. Uh, um, I analyzed the, the, these, and then there's some some uh, in the, in the evidence from the tones um, that um, so sort of disagrees with Stapa's interpretation. Or Stapa's interpretation was well. This is some evidence that say, I mean, he was looking at different aspects of this data anyway. Uh, let's say uh, don't have one heading, but um, she was. Um, a PhD student with Everett at the time, so uh, this was also kind of predictable. Uh, maybe mine were too. Uh, but anyway, there's some evidence there already. But anyway, so this is not uh, today. I'm pre presenting uh, newer evidence that was gathered, so also a while ago already, in 2009. Um, and there were um, Miguel, and there were three kind of people assisting. Me in this, so I must check them mostly. Uh, Miguel Oliveira, Selene Campitella, and Matthias Schenner. Um, and I'm going to report on two um, experimental, so not, not real experiment. I mean, the conditions are not like here in, in the lab, uh, here in the basement of CNS or something, but uh, a, a sort of, of fairly controlled uh, setups. In, first of all, I was targeting elicitation, so how would they describe a false belief scenario? Um, yeah, and the second one was um, a comprehension experiment that um, is also out somewhere. Uh, so, I will. so, this false belief uh, is actually the first thing we did when, uh, did when we arrived there, um, and it was designed to just uh, so it puts them in a natural scenario where they know who the actors are and what the, what the objects are, um, and um, but when, when somebody is holding a false belief and then has to describe this scenario, um, and you see this sort of sketched out here. So there were two uh, members of the tribe that were um, trained to act out this scenario. Um, and they had, um, I mean, uh, this was take place, I mean, you will see it in a short video also, in a house that actually ever built on the, in one of the uh, Iraha villages, um, in a little hut um, with a table. Um, so, but this, they were familiar with this environment, uh, because it's now mostly sitting empty there, but if it still exists anyway. Uh, and so they, and then there were um, three different objects but only one at a time that were getting hidden. Um, so uh, one of these was a tukuma nut, and there was like a, uh, a piece of manioc and a uh, piece of or, um, um, mango. Nee, papa, no, papaya, papaya, yeah. So he, all kind of objects that are sort of, that, I mean, for one, they, they are familiar with it, and two, that they find sort of desirable because it's food. Right? Um, all of them. And um, so actor one was then hiding this in uh, one hiding place, so there were like a, um, a basket, um, a, a wreath and a banana leaf or something. Uh, and those were the three um, um, on the table. And then um, his, uh, so now was an, his vision was blocked. Um, and then there was an unseen displacement of um, this um, object by actor two. Um, this whole scene was non-verbal, uh, this act out. And then and then the, the uh, actual subject was observing this from the other side of the table um, and was then asked questions um, by a translator, like, where is the nut? So we wanted to be sure that they actually know Follow this where the nut is, so we have to have it in the data uh, somewhere. Um, and um, something like this tour, tour was the actor one here. Um, the, the role of actor one changed in the course of this procedure. Um, so does he know what? And yeah, yeah, uh, some quantitative numbers here. 
Um, now we move on. Uh, I know I wanted to show you the video. Maybe that works. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know. Should I? Actors pulling the nut under the basket. Uh, uh, now you very clearly uh, blocked the vision. Now it's pulling the nut under the banana leaf, and that's that's what you did. Uh, and now the uh, subject he was, he wasn't seen yet. He, the actual subject was sitting on the other side. Um, was asked by what uh, what happened. Um, they they um, they provided they clearly the subject clearly understood this scenario, so they can understand this kind of this confusion about a false belief. Um, wouldn't have any doubts if they could do that, but just in case you're wondering. Um, and uh, then I mean, so they find this sort of. Uh, somewhat amusing um, the scenario, um, and then in many of the cases, they actually started describing it without really um, being tricked, needing the question as a trigger. Um, that was um, so. It's, the data is so messy in that way, um, possibly, and it's pre-production, so the data is just about I mean, whatever they said then. Um, and they, I don't know, um, and that's, kind of, that's probably, but um, there, there are some, uh, quite a few examples in there that are, um, we think, um, um, indicate um, embedding. So the way I've been looking at this um, data then is uh, when sort of looking at them for phrases. Oh, this is the one. Uh, Phrases that describe something that actually doesn't hold. So, um, in, in in the final scenario, um, so they, um, for example, say here, um, um, it's in the basket, or the nut is in the basket, right? Uh, this this means uh, means basket. I uh, no, no, uh, no. Anyway. Uh, um, anyway, uh, so the, I mean, we're actually nothing is in the basket or under the basket anymore, but it's under the banana leaf. Um, and they might have said in the somewhere else in their their uh, monologue uh, that it's under the banana leaf. Um, and then we're looking at well, when when there's such a sort of false uh, statement. Um, is there something somewhere around there that might be embedding that, um, in particular in front of that, um, and in many cases you find that, something in front of that. Maybe it's this uh, OP sinks um, something. Oh, I mean, this is in, in Everett's uh, work, he translates this guy say, it was a say, but there was no speaking going on here, and it's kind of frequent that say and sink. Uh, of related concepts. Uh, um, so that's an example that I think can be analyzed. But again, we can also possibly hear this. Oh, you didn't hear anything earlier, right? So I'll try that. But. Hmm. Sorry. It's very quietly. Um, sorry. Um, Anyway, I mean, you're not interested in much in biology, I hope. Uh, okay, and then uh, about sort of half of these um, utterances or parts of utterances that are made that are, don't seem to be sort of 
two utterances, uh, like utterance that the speaker would uh, make from his perspective, are actually questions. Um, so something like here, where is the papaya? Where the person speaking actually follows the whole scene and knows where the papaya is. Um, and then again, you can look whether there's something uh, around there that might be embedding those. Um, and lo and behold, there is something here in this uh, selected example, namely also here this uh, 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 side, or guy side in this case. So they sometimes change the roles, that's why I see it. Or pay and get story from it um, because it was too boring for them to always act out the same same role. So they wanted to to switch and with them. Uh, and uh, so I mean, so here Toy is the one who doesn't know where the papaya is, and so it's kind of natural to assume that this means something like Toy wonders where the papaya is. Toy asks himself where the papaya is. Um, now another. Way in which uh, sentences are uh, so not describable to the um, speaker's perspective is that when in any of these false sentences, like here, um, I don't know about the tukuma, um, is it, the, the speaker knows uh, the tukuma is this nut um, we had. Uh, um, th these sentences are, uh, I mean, not, not, not true from the perspective of the speaker because he knows where the Tukuma is, but it's also that the may kind of, so that in this case, now was the one who has the, uh, the actor one role, uh, knows that the speaker knows about the Tukuma, but it has to be actually for this to be a true sentence, we have to assume that there's indexical shift. Of this going on, so this is interpreted as me and as not as the actual speaker. Um, you might have been told here. Uh, so, um, this is a, should be like, I mean, either this is a kind of um, a direct speech report. Um, May says, I don't know about the Tukuma, um, or um, I mean, we actually never found, I mean, in all the cases where there's a problem in the uh, in this kind of false other, it was then um, uh, a first person pronoun. There are 19 cases of with the first person pronoun. There's not a single one with a sort of third person pronoun, which we would expect that may, uh, I mean, in English, maybe, uh, may says that he doesn't know about the, or thinks that he doesn't know about the Kukuma. Um, so, um, um, so, um, this then is, is a further argument that there is, there is some kind of um, embedding, including a lexical shift going on. This is um, examples um, that it's all, uh, always happening. So, so it's, it's contrary to what Everett described in this eighty-six work where he says that they have direct and indirect speech uh, reports, like English. Um, uh, maybe I mean this is very limited. The amount of evidence, so maybe I mean maybe that's correct. But uh, I mean we also I mentioned before this language Matt says that just has always um, obligatory indexical shift in the complement clauses. So that could also be what's going on here. Um, yeah. So now the uh, so preliminary <laughs> analysis of this is as follows: that uh, so I. Counted overall 53 of these false utterances in there, and um, um, the majority of them are following a, something that could be embedding them. And they always follow it, so it's either well, they immediately follow it, or there's another false sentence right in front, and then so there's possibly sort of um, either. Free indirect speech then going on, or there's a sort of sequence of, of um, embedding of a coordinated thing. Uh, uh, there's some variation, but um, mostly it's this guy side that is in the embedding. Um, and there's 13 
that are still to be analyzed and uh, possibly, I mean, uh, but these are the ones that are harder to sort of analyze, so maybe they will work it. I don't know what's going on with that, so that's kind of difficult. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, the video. Um, okay, yeah, this is uh, uh, so the second study that I only briefly mentioned, um, it then is um, testing uh, uh, this in comprehension. Um, so, so, we were, uh, so we did something which involved um, a correct reports of a false statement. So this were a dialogue, so one person makes, a, makes an assertion uh, that is false, and then a second person um, report, reported this. So the false assertion would be something like, my tongue is white. Um, and then uh, the second assertion would be something like, Tori says that his tongue is white, which is the first person from in there. Um, and the reasoning was, well, I mean, if these are, are just interpreted as a uh, coordination, um, this should be false because, I mean, well, Tori was talking, it's true maybe, but um, his tongue isn't white. Um, you know that. Um, and um, but if they uh, understand that what we are asking here for, for sentence B and uh, whether that's, uh, that's okay or not, whether he, he, he did it okay, uh, um, then um, and, and they and, and interpret this as embedding, then it would be true, right? I mean, he correctly reported what the first person said. Um, and we did include a control. Uh, condition. I, I did include a control condition of uh, inaccurate reports, um, and um, the results are down here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is a and there is a significant difference in the the expected direction. Uh, we judge these um, more frequently as okay than the other ones. There's a lot of noise in this data, but you can imagine that um, I was running up and down. The first one is my laptop. Uh, Giving people this, this sentences over over headphones in some cases also, and this was all very unfamiliar to them, and so they didn't. Uh, there were other factors coming into this data. Okay, um, so that the sort of I mean the maybe the preliminary and yeah whatever. And as the I said, I mean they because they have this rigid order of something preceding the, so these false sentences. Um, and they understand that as um, reporting possibly false statements or false belief, um, that they, they do have sort of complement clauses I mean, in the same way that English basically does, except they don't have a complementizer that's there. Um, and possibly there's, with respect to indexical shifts, they are also different from uh, English, I'd say. They're more like Matzes, but I think so unusual. Um, I'm not keeping track of my time. You, you, you are doing that, or somebody, yeah? Uh, yeah. 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 So you have another 15 minutes. Okay. Good. Yeah. And then, uh, actually, we just here. Um, so now the second type of language that I wanted to report on is um, is exemplified uh, initially by old Babylonian. Um, in Deutscher's work, and he reports that they, um, in uh, that all the examples of of um, sort of complementation in this old Babylonian he finds also this form here that there is a sort of a, uh, I mean they always involve umma, so the, there are those that where there is a sort of a propositional attitude work like I answered him, and then you have um, Uma, which I mean, we see he actually means something like say. So, uh, so I answered him, and then it is I say, uh, and then he usually omits. So this is not my my laziness, but Deutsche usually omits and the content of the compliment. Um, and uh, I mean, here you see another one of this type. So you have they said to me, and then you have here they say. So it's a different subject pronoun. Um, and Dosha translates these as a kind of uh, coordination. Um, so I answered, and this is what I said, or something. 
Uh, and what's this? What's Let's say, and then it, I mean, the Oma on its own can also just be the verb for say. And, then, and, and this is sort of a frequent informed grammaticalization. And in the later stages of Babylonian, uh, so the pronoun here disappears, and the Oma uh, is used as a complementizer. And then there's a uh, new verb for say, or well, it's, a, it's sort of initially Oma. Then they start using the Oma. Uh, also with say as a complementizer. Um, so lose sort of season. This the complementizer umma is a verb say umma. And then at that point clearly uh, separate in the data. But he's saying in this early stage, I mean that seems in these data uh, like a plausible interpretation that say here yeah, some paratexts that the umma here um, is some kind of marking of this well this is the following is kind of the content of some propositional attitude. So this would be kind of a marking for this uh, propositive speech mode, a positive speech mode. And in a later book by Deutsche that is sort of a, directed at a popular audience, um, he takes this view that there is some, in the sort of, uh, of uh, clause of historical uh, Evolution of clause embedding. There is a stage where there's, uh, there's paratexts, and then some paratexts with this kind of quotative mark idea. But uh, this wouldn't be really embedding the following either. But it would be just kind of like a mood marking on it, sort of the idea. And then um, now we. Um, so the. the this old Babylonian is uh, a language that preserved, on, as I mentioned, on these clay tablets, um, and there's a very limited evidence. Well, I don't know, very limited. But there isn't got so much evidence, uh, finite evidence, definitely available. Um, and you, there's so there's only so much you can do there. And it seemed like a, I mean, then Deutsch seemed like a plausible interpretation, um, but um, to uh, I mean, but we, we somehow came across uh, a, a language that is exactly like Babylonian in, in the relevant respects, you think. Um, and um, this is spoken somewhere completely differently in also the island uh, Timor. There's some smaller islands in the uh, eastern Indonesia. And this is a language Teba, which is actually a Papuan language or non non-Austronesian language. Um, uh, spoken on, yeah, Panta is the name of the island. Um, and there is a very um, nice and detailed grammar available for this language. Um, came out in 2010 by Marianne Klamer. And um, she basically, uh, show it the next slide, she basically uh, describes this in the same way, um, embedding in the language, in the same way as. Um, as Deutsche does the, for Old Babylonian. Um, so, as I'm not being, so, I mean, so this kind of com com compared with this. And we um, did, um, so this is now involved Bart Hollebant and Frankie Jack Kainopville, um, field work on this language, trying to sort of probe this uh, further. Um, and, uh, we conclude, will conclude, uh, I suppose, see, that, that actually already at this old Babylonian stage, um, this, this represented like a complementizer that had agreement with the subject of the higher verb. Um, so initially, maybe an implausible analysis, but um, you will see the evidence in favor Anyway, um, so, so first, um, how is this like? Um, Old Babylonian, um, so um, the the sort of role of umma in Old Babylonian is taken by the verb for speak or say as well. The verb is wa in in Teva, uh, and um, there are other um, propositional attitude verbs. I find that said. I mean, there are some other verbs, but so and all, but all of these here that sort of. Uh, Combined with uh, some kind of finite sentence, um, 
have the following form that they, I mean, that they, uh, it's illustrated here. So that the, um, I mean, Klammer describes this here for the verb Valas, which most of the data is with that, constructed with that, so the verb tell. Um, and um, that there's always following that um, a form of the verb wa, or uh, here, awa, the correlative construction, she calls it. Um, and she, yeah, she knows that. Ah, uh, no, that's our note. This is also true for these other verbs. So all of them have this pattern that they have here. Uh, so you see this illustrated here. So this is here, uh, Nathan tells me. Uh, but then you have here, Ava. Uh, he's buying a small boat. Uh, so the uh, sort of plausible translation is something like, uh, Nathan talked to me and according to him, or he, or he said that he's buying a small boat. Um, and we actually first confirm sort of one that this is parallel to more parallel to um, the Babylonian than Klama reports in that when this Ava is not fixed here, but it's really the, I mean, you see that the A is appears here and here. And I think this is just sloppiness that we have a hyphen there and not in the other case. But, um, um, but when, when here the, the subject of the um, first verb, of the, of, the, sort of the main verb here, um, main attitude verb changes to something like second person plural, then you also get right, um, second person plural on the bar. Um, so we get the ye bar rather than a bar. Um, and that goes through the paradigm. I mean, even if you, there's a sort of uh, uh, indeterminate sort of person pronoun, like, like one in English, um, um, and that, that also works. So you get here uh, one tells me, one says. So, so, um, okay. um, so that sort of looks well, uh, looks very much like the old Babylonian. You would agree. Um, you know, um, the two things that we uh, one that I bought in here, this is very well printed right here, uh, is um, what happens in, when you negate these kind of secrets. So when you're going to say, yeah, he didn't tell me something. Um, if this was sort of this two independent sentences analysis, you would expect um, that it, you get something like, he didn't talk to me, he didn't tell me that he's doing that and that. Or maybe he, you could also get, he talked to me, but he didn't say that he's doing that or something. But, um, but you could, in, in principle, I mean, if he didn't talk to me at all, you could get uh, you would expect two negations on both the, the initial attitude of the talk uh, and the second verb, the um, say. Um, that's not how it's done, but you put just one negation on the on the verb tell, and then it has the, the kind of uh, meaning that uh, uh, he didn't tell me uh, that he's buying a small boat. So and this will be, I mean, True in a scenario where he actually told me something else, or like a correction of something he did. Um, so that's one argument. So for for this analysis, that we think is right that this is a, uh, already a complementizer even in this uh, stage where it looks exactly like the um, um, subject pronoun and the, the full verb say. Um, the second argument is that we um, managed to listed a few examples of long extraction across this valas element. Um, so you see one of these here. Uh, I don't know about this one maybe, but uh, here, so who did Ben tell us that will hit me? Um, and uh, yeah, that again would be unexpected if this is some kind of coordination or uh, in, uh, independent sentences thing. Um, we also, I'm not the right person to do that, uh, looked at the, the uh, declination in the, um, in the intonation. So in, uh, uh, it's known that in embedded sentences, the, the tone is, uh, doesn't have the same range as in a, in a matrix sentence. Uh, so so in, in the course of 
embedding. So when you have uh, he told me that uh, he uh, his mother um, told him that he would he should go to the store or something, then that sort of which is embedding the range of tone gets compressed. You know, that this is um, I believe declination uh, in this literature, and um, lo and behold, we find something like this happening here in uh, in Teva in these sequences. Um, the, and uh, finally, um, this the, there's a little bit of evidence that some, in, uh, um, one speaker at least uh, did not use the normal full form here, Ava, as sort of this uh, marking the subordination, but reduced this by mocalizing the Ava to uh, something like just uh, so something more like Ahua, um, so reducing this, and that is sort of the expected direction of uh, grammaticalization, maybe, of sort of this Ava becoming uh, uh, more reduced. And there is, I mean, in, this, uh, in a different part of the world, uh, a completely different language family, there's a like, uh, um, in, Description of a language that sort of looks like what uh, maybe soon Teva would also look like. Um, and this is the language uh, Nanti, so work by Lev Michael, uh, uh, the dissertation actually. Uh, and uh, no, okay, and in this language, uh, and, uh, this is maybe the relevant example. So in, in this language, there is a, so, so he also dis transcribes this as a qualitative marker, ka. Um, and it has agreement, so you see it here. This means something like uh, uh, I don't know. Sorry, uh, this is something like they tell uh, he tell me uh, something. The first person. Uh, the first person here. Yeah, he tell me, and then he uh, that his son or something uh, goes to visit me or something. Yeah, something like that. I think. Or, or will come to visit him or I'm not quite sure. Um, anyway, but the, the crucial point is here there's this, this qualitative marker and it has here a third person agreement because the subject of say he is also third person. Um, whereas um, here you have the first person subject of here tell um, and you have the qualitative ka um, now also this first person agreement. Um, and I mean this sort of so the, the car is kind of the same as wa, um, but it, the car itself is not the verb say, um, but it's the car is reduced from here. You have the full verb say is this can't, um, and it, it's reduced just to car um, in this language. So there's some kind of grammatical. I mean, this is only used as a kind of in this complementizer function in nanti, but it still has this agreement with the embedding. It's the subject of the matrix work. Uh, okay, so that was that was uh, Teva. Um, we well, think that there also this ma is a, really already a complementizer that then would presumably carry over this analysis to old Babylonian. And if we ever find the right clay tablet, then mm -hmm. we might have evidence for that as well. Uh, uh, I, I, not keeping my hopes up. Okay. So um, now I wanted to sort of make a perspective on this, where this is maybe a little uh, more interesting this year, more, but I don't know. But, um, so, but, yeah, I mean, uh, this is sort of the, the more flex part. Or, um, I mean, uh, so it, it, it's there's these elements that we've been looking at here. Um, so, so false beliefs or negation and uh, false belief reports um, are interesting in that they are, uh, if you, I mean, think about so what a simple language with just one word sentences um, would be able to express, they go, would go beyond that. So, I mean, uh, I mean so we are, we are done sort of is establishing this ubiquity thing and maybe is this allow me five minutes here for some speculation or I might not be able to successfully carry this out anyway. Um, so um, when you think about a language that has just one word, word sentences, um, I mean the, and the sort of normal 
uh, discourse properties of English. I mean, people presumably in the speaking of this language, or um, people I don't know, but I mean, for example, this people, agents uh, speaking this language would have sent sort of basically a co conjunction as a, uh, uh, as a composition. Um, and because after they assert something, um, then sort of so they have only the states that are compatible with what they, this one sentence that they just said, are still kind of part of the common ground. Um, after that, then they can't basically negate what they just said because the negation would have to go to, I mean, to the to the complement set of the, the initial thing, but that that becomes unavailable by the coordination. Um, and similarly for all of belief reports, and I mean, once they said something, they can't sort of say, well, this is something that. I don't believe or that I mean can can sort of step back from asserting this. Um, yeah, so the these things. Um, and um, so they so they sort of hear this basic uh, compositional mode of composition um, that gets you know, possibly quite far. Um, like um, I mean if you are believer of neo davidsonian semantics who think you can do the basic clause with, with that. Um, but negation and false belief reports amongst the things um, that clearly require something extra, unless you, you sort of expand your ontology into like uh, ways that, that I, I don't find out uh, motivated, uh, are possible to motivate. Uh, um, so, I mean, modulo, modulo that, it holds that we're looking here at things that could possibly go beyond this normal conjunctive uh, composition that possibly does sort of the basic uh, clause, clausal composition. Um, and um, and, and the, the hope here is that, that this might help um, sort of tying up in a possibly interesting way, um, work um, and then improve improve upon current work that is exists on the uh, evolution of compositionality. Um, and there, there's two lines of work out there, uh, mostly done by by non linguists. So I'm not, uh, a little, a little and so um, I mean, but. Um, and, and but the way to classify the two lines of work that are out there, I think, uh, sort of, um, is actually so. Chomsky sometimes has uh, uh, asser, uh, asserts something about uh, sort of the, the uh, role of different elements for the um, evolution of language, and they, they are distinguished clearly by uh, I think by the by the role of communication in the evolution of um, compositionality. So Chomsky has this strong belief that, uh, well, strong, I don't know, but I mean, he, has, he at least writes it uh, some, in, in some places that, uh, and it says that thought is somehow primary, and then there's a language, it's kind of a s primarily a system for maybe building thoughts, and then there's this externalization, um, so the pronunciation or uh, gesturing of language um, the, um, for, for communication is kind of uh, something very late and sort of not so relevant um, for language. So the, the view here is one that communication is really um, not an important property of language that, that needs to be uh, that has sort of influence uh, uh, the development of language in it uh, is, is important for the understanding of language or something. I mean, sometimes, maybe I think uh, Chomsky also means this mostly as a provocation, but, uh, but uh, uh, there, is, there is a good argument that, sort of, that we have, maybe that well, it seems to be largely language uh, not care about the mode of externalization, so you can, the modality, so you can uh, uh, spoken and uh, Signed language and also these yeah, other things. 
I don't know so much about. Um, and in the yeah, in the work that is out there on the evolution of uh, compositionality, um, most people. Um, so they made no this, but uh, I, I think I, in the in the Chomsky camp that they think well, basically we have a compositional language of thought, uh, and then sort of if then they, they sort of say well, and, uh, I mean, uh, assuming that I mean they don't they don't Marx is sort of very strongly as, a, as an assumption, but it then can kind of be deduced quite easily that if this compositional system of thought was then hooked up to some kind of communicative uh, device, um, then compositionality would just be um, emerged very easily. So there's a person in Edinburgh, Kirby, who has worked along this line, also experimental work, sort of where he gives people who obviously have a compositional language and system already uh, um, some, some, some sort of rudimentary language game and sort of artificial language that they then, in, in the course of this game, uh, uh, transform into a fully compositional language. And there's similar work by um, Silton and uh, uh, so anyway, the, the, the other line of work that's out there that I mean, can fix up more interestingly, maybe with this, um, I'm doing uh, this division between sort of this um, uh, uh, coordination and then possibly something that goes beyond it, is a um, work by uh, Martin Novak and uh, uh, to other people here, Novak, Martin and Jansen. And, and there really the assumption is that um, um, somehow compositionality in thought and language I mean, it you know, comes about uh, uh, simultaneously, basically. Or somehow, um, that's sort of the, the result of the, uh, the system. And they point out that, I mean, basically what, what this paper then points out is, well, once you have a compositional language, you, and then under certain assumptions you have a easier time to learn the signals, the meaning of the individual signals of the language. Um, because if you have so this composition A, B, and uh, A, C, and then if, uh, or a C, D, and then you, you kind of maybe learn the meaning of A and of A, B, C, and D already, then you can also interpret signals, like sequences like A and B that you never heard before. Um, and under certain assumptions, that, uh, then is um, is a faster, more efficient way of sort of uh, sorting a, uh, of a communication system. So they, they actually they come up with a specific number. I mean, once you have to distinguish more than one hundred and eight words, um, uh, it's better to have a compositional system. Um, I mean. So their system is, is sort of more interesting. But it has, sort of, it has a problem that they actually make a very simple assumptions about language. So they basically, they compare this one word, uh, non compositional language, with um, two word uh, compositional language. That's, just, that's not right. Um, and um, so this would mean that, I mean, I mean this gives kind of these people who are the species who has a composition or communication system, an unfair advantage because they, the, the assumption is that they also, only they can produce a sequence of, of, of words or sentences. This is sort of independent of compositionality, maybe some, uh, but, but I mean, the little that is known, uh, at least to me, about, about uh, primate, communication systems and uh, other things uh, out there in the world is that they all, all these other species already have uh, can produce sequences of signals um, whether they have compositional systems or not I mean I don't know whether that I can fully gut but they, they can produce sequences so this one word uh, limit um, is not really motivated I think motivated both. Um, 
nice one. So the basis here is kind of saying, well, I mean, maybe a, a better model is one where, where there's conjunction uh, initially uh, already available in this one word uh, system that I presented earlier. Um, and then something else is added to that. And um, you can if you take this conjunction at least literally, um, it follows that, I mean, then conjunction allows you to, even if you, uh, so with a finite vocabulary, allows you to produce only a finite set of messages, um, and, um, uh, two to the number of uh, words that you have minus one, um, but I mean, because but the, the, it should be order invariant and also repetition it shouldn't add anything to the meaning. And then once you have kind of a system where there's more, um, where there's some other operation that's order sensitive, let's say, uh, um, things might, um, I mean, then what if you also you can produce sequences, um, I mean, um, I'm, I'm sort of vague about what this might be, but uh, then at least uh, these might all have a different meaning since uh, uh, order or repetition might affect the meaning of these things. So you might have then sort of an infinity of, um, uh, get to an infinity of distinct messages. So now that it's not one or eight, that's a, the boundary, but it's sort of having a finite thing versus uh, infinitely many um, meanings that you can convey. Okay, uh, that was, okay, so then um, I'm now finished. Uh, so we have some, uh, presented some new empirical evidence for uh, the universality of complement clauses. Um, and I had, uh, I had this speculation that, I mean, the, um, so there's this, this semantic mode of composition that is involved in, in uh, laws of embedding, but presumably also in negation, um, um, would be in a, plausibly in a, in a uh, plausible, right? uh, that's exaggerating one, in a model where there is sort of this evolution of compositionality, we distinguish two different modes of composition, which seems um, to me plausible. Um, what have a special place? Okay, thank you. behave like direct speech in English. So the direct speech in English has, in some sense, has, I mean, that's not the, possibly the analysis, but it uh, could be analyzed as indexical shift plus some kind of uh, constraint that would be a literal representation of what was said earlier. Um, in in BRH, uh, I mean, as a, so there's a, maybe also a, I mean, we, we, I mean, we only yeah, have like 19 cases with a pronoun in here, uh, and in none of them, they could have, if they had also something without an ethical shift in all of these, they could have used a third person uh, right. pronoun. Um, 
but they never did. Right. Um, so either right. they have some kind of preference for uh, this, or well, maybe the other one is. Not, but that we can't say. Here, right? right. But you're analyzing, regardless of that. I, I take your mm -hmm. point that. It, okay. But what you're saying is these are complement clauses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, right. Yes. Um, um, and so you are sort of separating as a matter of logical possibility the form of the, say, pronouns used in the clause from its complement status. Yeah? In uh, principle? So, no, if, I, right? no, so the I, use of the first person pronoun to refer um, to the speaker in the subordinate clause, mm -hmm. sorry, um, to refer to the subject of the higher predicate, mm -hmm. that speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the subordinate yeah. clause. You're, what you're saying is that doesn't mean it's not complement. You're saying it can still yeah, be a complement, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, there's, I mean, I only mentioned sort of this work on Matsuzabir, but, 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 it means, know that there are quite a few languages that uh, allow indexical shift of, especially the first person, pronoun under something like say, I mean, this is actually, there was no speaking happening, so it could be really sync here, but, um, um, I mean, English happens to be a language where that's... But not that there is an indexical shift, there's a good indication that it has to be embedded, because if it was matrix, it would mean that the speaker has some length. I mean, it, these things would be obviously false if, the, if I refer to the speaker. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it cannot be matrix. It has to be embedded. Yeah, yeah that, that, if there was no right. indexical shift, then you couldn't say whether it's matrix right. or not. Right. So that's what shows, and that's what shows that you have to, that those two things don't necessarily have to go together. Uh, I mean, in England. Yeah. Those things they do, or if I understand, I mean. I say, isn't it misunderstanding? I mean, I, I think that this indexical shift. I, I think we're using the terms differently, so. Yeah, I mean, that's why I think that's that they are confusing, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, my assumption was like, is that, I mean, here, so we have, this is a complement clause, I, I don't right. know about the document. Right. Um, and it's. Uh, it's a complement of the verb say, and the verb say at least allows, um, probably prefers, to have sort of this indexical shift property, which then leads to the, the I here being the interpreter as referring to me rather than the actual speaker. The speaker, right, the current speaker. Um, right, right. And, um, Okay, so I, 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 I mean, I, I don't that. think that these are any different from the other, um, I mean, I, from these types of examples, or here there's a better question, I mean, uh, these also, I mean, if there wasn't a lexical in there, then it might also have shifted, so, uh, I mean, so in this approach, it may be actually a strategy to make it more clear that you're talking about Report of someone else's speech and not your own. Uh, mm -hmm. Two weeks. Because these, these the contents are so implausible, so that it would be mm -hmm. ambiguous between uh, he said something and he doesn't know about the people matter versus he said that he doesn't know about the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't have lost it, I say. I mean, some of the, the, the difference between those two seems to be then. I mean, this, he said something, maybe, I mean, maybe he said something else, and it's, it's not good, but if he thought something, it's basically vacuous, and if it's just uh, thing. I mean, and there was no speaking by yeah, these also two actors. So, um, yeah, uh, but. Um,
I remember mm -hmm. reading yeah. an article about that says that um, uh, was in that it's in that collection by Dixon and Eichenbach, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, but um, which okay. reports that there's only one embedding predicate in that says, and it means to believe in correctly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have no no way of evaluating the truth of this claim, <laughs> but uh, it was quite striking in view of the you know gigantic literature on false beliefs, etc. The idea that you could have just one one embedding predicate in a language that would mean so that. Have to have a group no. Hmm? So they don't have a group no. That was the, that's the claim. Only one embedding predicate. Um, I know um, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. That's why I remember it. <laughs> No, so this is, I mean, the person who initially described Matzes, David Fleck, and he actually, we worked together with him, because uh, he now lives in the, with the tribe. Um, and, uh, uh, and these cases, so these involve some kind of, Hence, shift that is uh -huh. additionally there. Uh, uh, double evidential system is tense on both of them or something. Um, yeah. Okay. So the, the, I mean, yeah, we don't have actually results of that, but I mean, we just, yeah. I mean, one of the things we did with Matthias was because, uh, and so I, I actually never went there, but I never two credits. So, so. Uh, worked with, with David Flexer, and they translated from Spanish, which is sort of like English indirect speech, into Matzes, so the, the, not all of the tribes members are bilingual, but uh, quite a few are, and they, they would always shift all the indexicals okay. around, so they uh, consistently, I think. Mm -hmm. they would place come with go and uh, uh, tomorrow or less yesterday. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, I think, I mean, I was just, what was just about to say, right? I mean, so I, I would think that that also is embedding um, something there. I mean, it might be that's in. Yeah, no, this is, yeah, I, I sort of have to remember. But in, in, the, I mean, this case, so this might make, I think this is in the context of the only cases of embedding where there is no, not indexical shift, are uh, you know, these constructions that involve some kind of um, remote past and mm -hmm. are only used in special mm -hmm. circumstances mm -hmm. in some way. Um, so, yeah, it's not quite accurate here. But yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I said about so there's a little bit of, of that, but we actually didn't yeah. manage to have any any deeper investigation of that part of it.